Today's talk um, is, <clears throat> um, I, I, I don't want to call it very much, but perhaps it's a set of uh, uh, ruminations. It's a set of um, uh, interlinked ideas <clears throat> that I've been kind of working on uh, since a little after the, the beginning of the uprising uh, in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, trying to make sense of uh, the context of uh, the uprising and relation as, as, as part of my life and uh, uh, as art, working in the field of art, uh, especially internationally also, <coughs> as another part of my life. Trying to make a meaning of being in these uh, two worlds uh, it takes the format of um, a set of imagined diary entries. Um, so uh, each one has a little title and I start talking and uh, hopefully they make uh, some kind of sense. Uh, the first uh, entry uh, is called the center of meaning is empty. It's the early days, the first few days after Mubarak's removal as head of state. I am in a taxi, sitting next to the driver, taking me to where I work, ACAF, where I haven't been in over two weeks. He is driving down the Corniche, as it is called here, the long highway-ish road running parallel to the Mediterranean. I am looking at my city, out of the car window. I see hundreds of teenagers and young adults painting on the walls. What they are painting worries me a great deal. I take it as a sign for some misfortunes to come. One wall painting shows military officers holding the Egyptian flag out of a tank cockpit. The line, the people of Egypt are victorious, is written on top. The Egyptian flags, red, white, and black, are painted everywhere, almost in every corner, even on the pavements. These kids are ruthless with the paintbrush. These are strong colors. They are, no they are noisy. <clears throat> they are making the bluish turquoise color of the sea less beautiful. I feel an excessive nationalism that is intrinsically tied to the military nature of the state. I say to myself, the revolution hasn't even begun. For the first time, I realized the importance of a term that is rarely used today. The term is edification. Now, I don't want to tie you with the same ideas on uh, edification that I attempted to illuminate in the exhibition and the related exhibition booklet, but perhaps just the definition. A quick dictionary search today will tell you that edification means to perhaps uh, to instruct, especially so as to encourage intellectual, moral, or spiritual improvement. That it denotes an uplifting enlightenment that results in understanding and the spread of knowledge. I think edification posits a much more complex problem than ideology. How intellectual debate is structured today is basically polarized between two thought patterns that seem to predeterminate how we think. So say if I were just, to, just for example, Slavoj Zizek, I would always move towards the pole of ideology as being the main reason for our perplexed state of being. On the other hand, or the other pole, if I, were, if I am a thinker, and this is very generally speaking, whom is thought of as representing an other, and outside of what has been constructed as the continental tradition, as the continental tradition. Say, for example, someone like Tarek Ramadan, who is becoming more and more popular within contemporary art contexts. I would always move towards the pole of culture as being the main system that sorts out power, relations, and politics, etc. Of course, there have been many attempts recently to find systems of thought that can escape and construct other possibilities or polarizations, if you like, 
most notably what has been termed as speculative realism or speculative materialism and object-oriented philosophy. Now, for me, the concept of a persisting edification in most societies on the <coughs> in most societies on the idea of making life better. Ah, sorry. Uh, uh, now, for me, the, the 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 concept of a persisting edification that humanity cannot rid of it, rid itself of, that we as humans have built the continuation of our existence in most societies on the idea of making life better, making better humans, and better everything, is the cause for much fear, and also the cause for much hope. The Berlin Biennial asks us to forget fear. But what I think is implicated is something like the statement, if, we, if you want to make the world better, life better, we must forget our feelings of fear. But I think to do that, we must have hope in the notion of betterment. And here I must stress, betterment is different from progress because it transcends all ideologies and historic periods and even religions it seems to be the motive behind the development of life systems. What would religions do? What would politics do? What would education do if they did not seek to make better or make efficient or more efficient or make more efficient humans? Progress, on the other hand, is more specific, is much more specific. One can define it as post enlightenment betterment. But what if for example, one did not have much hope in betterment as the main driving force behind thought. Derrida and Foucault, I think, exemplified this stream. But today it seems most thinkers are unable to build the foundations of their thought outside betterment and thus edification. I think to place oneself outside of edification and betterment is a tactical move of the intellect. To do so, one must first have full doubt in the notion of hope. Have no hope for hope. Why? Because what drives hope? Betterment. Hope usually takes me to Schopenhauer's famous definition of it, where he concludes, quote, hope is the confusion of the desire for a thing with its probability. Hope is the confusion for the desire of a thing with its probability. Being an ontological subject of both, one, the never-ending Arab Spring, two, of an ambiguous and elastic entity labeled the art world, a frustrated hope is always just around the corner in many discussions in both these worlds, in both of those spaces and their intersections. If we look at Schopenhauer's definition closely, three words stick out. Confusion, desire, and probability. There are many questions that instantly come to mind here, such as what exactly causes the confusion between the desire for a thing and its probability, and who or what has the effective power to declare something probable or improbable. I think these two questions are at the heart of what one is witnessing and going through on a daily basis while living on the intercutting planes of politics, life, daily life and culture. I want to focus on the first of those two questions. What exactly causes the confusion between the desire for a thing and its probability? I think the most likely answer would be something like ideology. And I would probably disagree with that answer. I think what we witnessed or are still witnessing in Egypt, in Syria, in Bahrain, in Greece, in Spain, in New York, and elsewhere, although extremely different, shares at least one thing. And I think that thing is the gradual uncovering of what is actually behind ideology. The source of ideology, or ideologies in plural, if you like. So for me, I don't see that what people are grouping to declare independence from is ideology or established ideology. 
because these ideologies are already within the field of simulacra, already failed with historic and contemporary proof of failure. For any act to, may, uh, to mean something substantial today, it must bypass the question of ideology. I think what is slowly being reified and made concrete is that behind ideology lies something that is much more complex, and I would say archaic, something ancient, something that at first sight appears to be unexplainable. Join some Facebook groups of various political orientations and you will be flooded with signs that bring into use everything from the leftist clutched fist to various religious symbols. Join these groups for they exist almost everywhere for almost every society through both, their <coughs> through both the proliferation and distribution of these signs and identities and the systematic attempt to crush them through both these polarizations, one begins to realize that what is slowly being revealed after the consistent use of ide ideological semiotics by the rebellious and their states, states alike, what is slowly being revealed is that behind ideology lies a whole complex history of something that we can call, perhaps, edification. In the 18th century, edification began to place itself at the crossroads of the, of the epistemological and ontological thinking that was constructing the intellectual pillars of modernism in Europe. What the edification seems to describe from that time onwards is the struggle between the individual's autonomy as a self with a will and his or her existence within the contribution to a larger community. This is the beginning of edification's interest in aesthetics since aesthetics is a domain that is intrinsically connected to the idea of representation. And to think of a balance between the autonomy of the individual's will and the individual's functioning within a community, one must begin to think of, represent of representation. I think that what we are witnessing today is edification being laid bare, made naked, that what constitutes constitutes us as human beings is formed at least in large part by the sum of edification processes we have been through. This is exactly why the rebellious demand things but actually have no ready alternatives for the systems they want to replace. If 1989 was the year when ideologies fell to the market, 2011 was the year when the market began to fall to reveal edification, to reveal something even more difficult to unpack than ideology. Something that when we refuse, we are automatically refusing part of ourselves. I think Flaubert understood edification when he proclaimed, it seems to me that I have always existed and that I possess memories that date back to the pharaohs. In other words, how we relate to time and thus how we perceive the world is formulated by composite layers of edification processes that have formed both the modern and the contemporary human subject. Some of these processes remain vernacular, applicable to specific communities only. <coughs> others, others transcend the vernacular and reach most societies in the world through intellectual power, economic influence, or sheer force, of course. The young people painting tanks, flags, and soldiers in the early days of the revolution in Alexandria upheld the edification of Nasser, the pan arabist leader of the 50s and the 60s, and the military state, and sustained it in what was supposed to be its moment of death. It was only when some began realizing that their whole identities had been constructed on meanings that were empty at their center a manufactured vernacular edific edification of 60 or so years that the revolution really started. The center of, me of the meaning of a nation's identity and of art is always empty, always ready to be filled up by power or concept. That's the center of the meaning of a nation's identity or of art only becomes a new identity or a new art when it is filled with ideas that can counteract older edifications without re-edifying its people or audience. 
until we live under the edification, until then we live under the edification of the past. Entry number two. Death, the martyr, the hero, and art. Allow me to start this entry by quoting a long paragraph from Michel de Certeau's The Practice of Everyday Life. Quote, the staff of a hospital withdraws from the dying man. The syndrome of withdrawal on the part of the doctors and nurses, the dis this distancing is accompanied by orders in a vocabulary that treats the patient as though he were already dead. He needs to rest, let him sleep. It is necessary that the dying man remain calm and rest because the care and the sedatives required by the sick man, this order appeals, uh, sick, this order appeals to the staff's inability to bear the uttering of anguish, despair or pain. It must not be said the dying are outcasts because they are deviants in an institution organized by and for the conservation of life. An anticipated mourning, a phenomenon of institutional rejection, puts them away in advance in the dead man's room and surrounds them with silence or worse yet with lies that protect the living against the voice that would break out of this enclosure to cry, I'm going to die. This cry would produce an embarrassingly graceless dying. More than that, as a dead man on reprieve, the dying man falls outside the thinkable, which is identified with what one can do in leaving the field circumscribed by the possibilities of treatment. This is important. It enters a region of meaninglessness. Nothing can be said in a place where nothing more can be done. Along with the lazy man, and more than he, the dying man, is the immoral man. The former a subject that does not work, the latter an object that can no longer even make itself available to be worked on by others. Both are intolerable in a society in which the disappearance of subjects is everywhere, compensated for and camouflaged by the multiplication of the tasks to be performed. Now, why am I <clears throat> making this point? Not just because there is a lot of death in the air, but because I think this concept of the dying man as portrayed by, this, by De Sarteau is exactly the point at which the hero is made. Heroes are important, not of course in the sense of the Bonnie Tyler song, I Need a Hero, but in the sense that the concept of the hero is a crucial building block for both the maintenance and reconstruction of societal ideas and identities. In popular film, the hero, as in the picture behind me, <coughs> the hero can be defined as he who, he or she, but mostly he, he who holds the strength to not only survive entering the region of meaninglessness that De Sarteau mentioned, but to actually make meaning and reason out of this re uh, region of meaninglessness. Can you repeat this one? Yes. In popular film, the hero can be defined as he who, who holds the strength to not only survive entering the region of meaninglessness that De Soto mentioned, but to actually make meaning and reason of the, meaning, of the region of meaninglessness. Take, for example, I Am Legend in 2007, featuring Will Smith. Smith stars <clears throat> as Dr. Robert Neville, uh, who is a scientist who was unable to stop the spread of a terrible virus was, that was incurable and man-made. <clears throat> Immune, Neville is now the last human survivor in what is left of New York City, and perhaps the world. 
For three years, Neville has faithfully sent out daily radio messages desperate to find any other survivors who might be out there. But he is not alone. Mutant victims of the plague, the infective, lurk in the shadows, watching Neville's every move, waiting for him to make a fatal mistake. Perhaps ma mankind's last <coughs> best hope, Neville is, uh, uh, Neville is driven by only one remaining mission, to find a way to reverse the effects of the virus using his own immune blood. But he knows he is outnumbered and quickly running out of time. And of course, <coughs> if you've seen the film, uh, I have a clip here. I don't know if you're interested in showing, but I mean, if somebody wants to see, we can show it. Uh, <coughs> if you've seen the if you've seen the film, um, the uh, the um, uh, the end of the film is that he actually he dies, but before he dies, he he manages to uh, give. The, uh, the serum to uh, um, two people who he found that were also living. And these two people managed to find a small colony of survivors in uh, the center of America, outside of New York. And so life goes on through the death of uh, Dr. Robert Neville. Now, I mean, for me, <coughs> the, the image that was most haunting, haunting in the film was not the uh, was not the images of these spook characters, you know, these people with with viruses that came out of the dark and started, you know, to eat each other and that kind of stuff. It was actually the image of uh, Robert Neville or Will Smith in this case uh, and his dog walking alone in New York, which for me is the epitome of meaninglessness. I mean, like the image itself is is that point where there's <laughs> there's no meaning to carry on. Uh, I mean, if it's just you and your dog, and there's the and you kind of know that you're the last living creatures on planet Earth, it doesn't make sense for you to actually uh, continue life. I mean, the logical thing, if if we are to think of reason, would be to commit suicide. But no, Neville continues, and he manages to give life. You know, he managed to, and this is the making of the hero. Now, why am I saying this? Why am I talking about the hero? Because I think that the hero is, is like I mentioned before, is a very important character, but it's also been re, uh, uh, let's say, re-characterized or re-interpreted uh, in, in, uh, within the, the context of, of uh, 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 the uprisings, uh, the current uprisings in uh, North Africa and the Arab world. And um, uh, it's portrayed through a slightly different character. That character is the martyr. And let me, let me read from this point on. In the early days of the now famous 18-day January-February 2011 protests, an artist, Ahmed Basuni, is killed by police snipers. Egypt's small art community grieves online, <coughs> in Tahrir Square and in dusty neon-lit cafes. It's now June 2011. The artist's work is representing Egypt at the Venice Biennial. Video documentation of a performance piece by the artist has been re-edited to include footage of the artist in revolution on the night he was shot dead. Some critics affiliated with the state-run cultural circle attack the pavilion. It is probably the first time that a young artist uh, attack in the sense of uh, like a, a literary attack, not a physical attack. It is, uh, it is probably the first time that a young artist from without the ranks of the fine arts sector, the visual arts division within the Ministry of Culture, has been awarded such a prestigious solo presentation. Whispered questions circulate. Why did the Ministry of Culture accept this proposal? Could it have something to do with the improvement of its own image, and thus the image of the state? In the end, most agree that it was a positive thing to have the martyr artist, as he is often referred to, to represent Egypt at the biennial. 
Fast forward, <coughs> we are now in November 2011. The Mata count is rapidly increasing, and the state seems to be an even worse version of what it was before the removal of Mubarak. It now has more instruments of, rep of repression and oppression, the military police as well as the police. Revolutionaries are losing the, symp the sympathy of the majority of the nation. State media manipulation, state-engineered lawlessness and economic hardship, and the divide and rule tactics <coughs> administrated by the ruling junta have proven successful in the long, long run. In this climate, the martyr and the rights of martyrs become one of the few points of public empathy that still hold some strength in the media war between the revolution and the state. I remember an interesting revelation by Peter Sloterdijk from his book, Rage in Time. Quote, no modern human being can put himself back into a time where the concepts of war and happiness formed a meaningful constellation. For the first listeners of Homer, however, war and happiness are inseparable. The bond between them is founded upon the ancient cult of heroes. We moderns know this cult only within the square brackets of historical education. For the ancients, this heroism was no subtle attitude, but the most vital of all possible responses to the facts of life. A world without heroes would have been worth nothing in their view. Such a world would have meant a state in which human beings would have been exposed to the monarchy of nature without any resistance. So, in a sense, like this is told, Sloterdijk is saying that a hero is he who makes meaning a meaning out of a meaningless situation. <clears throat> and I think that's the real meaning of the word hero. And in a sense, that is why uh, the martyr today, within the context of a contemporary uh, revolutionary uh, cycle, uh, can be seen as the uh, why the martyr is important. Not just because of death, but because the martyr represents this making meaning out of the meaningless situation. But also that is very difficult for art, I think when art has to suddenly find itself trying to make meaning in a context where meaning is made through death. Martyrdom and its representation in the media within a revolutionary context can also, be in see, can also be seen as a response to the dehumanizing effects of late capitalism and the vernacular list of partial and total tyranny, uh, ty tyrannies it has helped give rise to. For how else has been Bouazizi's self-immolation portrayed? However, it can also be argued that martyrdom is the ultimate act of dehumanization itself. By publicly annihilating oneself for a cause, the cause becomes greater than the self and makes the martyr's relationship to a wider anthropology of humanity that of a clog of sorts. Martyrships, um, sorry, martyrdom's relationship to art has a long history. From portrayals of the crucifixion to the endurance performance, art of the 60s and the 70s, and the more subtle disappearance of Bastian Adder. The difference is that art is always seen here as a compensatory cultural response, while martyrdom plays a very real pays a very real price in the public imaginary. This is why art, in a state of revolution, suffers and is downgraded even more than it usually is, and is even sometimes attacked by those who practice it, like the Berlin Biennial, for example, because it cannot compete with martyrdom. If we can all agree that art does not have to compete with martyrdom, then art would be fine.
entry number three, and I think this will probably be the last entry. <clears throat> sovereign, sovereign tree and art, a concise history, the case of Egypt. This entry starts on Facebook. Yes. Okay, so I move it like this. Okay, very good. This entry starts on Facebook. <clears throat> it's no secret that the excessive frustration, anticipation, anxiety, and confusion of the current political moment in Egypt has made me made thinking effectively hard for some, struggling to produce and sustain interesting thought. Facebook is a space where this frustration and anxiety can be released and expressed, but is also a haven for escapism from the difficult tasks of structured potent thought and artistic creation. <clears throat> About a month or so ago, I found myself participating in a discussion related to the, po to the posting on Facebook of a YouTube video where the now unsuccessful presidential candidate Hamdin Sabahi, the guy behind me here, is interviewed in 2005 about the Iraq war. Sabahi is a politician who has been described as a neo nasserist What neo nasserism is and how it could be, how it should be defined within the current political framework is a matter for a different uh, entry or speaker to pursue. But for this point I'm taking the discussion the video helped initiate as a, a starting point to think about Nasserism and its consequences on the pre and post intellectual uh, Nasserist intellectual and artistic fields. The video is titled in Arabic Hamdin Sabahi and his defense of Al-Qaeda organization you won't believe it share. In the video, we witness Sabahi react in a rather charged manner and declare that any gun pointed towards US Marines in Iraq is good, even if it's an Al-Qaeda gun, and that Al-Qaeda's presence in Iraq as a form of resistance is a positive phenomenon that should be supported. The overreaction on Facebook to this, the, these statements help me in putting my finger on something I would like to explore further. But for now, I have some preliminary ideas on. Um, I, have, I have some preliminary ideas on that I would like to quickly sketch out. As a response to one of these surprised and appalled comments on Facebook, I wrote, I disagree with him completely, but this is the default Nasserist position regarding foreign intervention. Sovereignty is probably the most important thing to a Nasserist. One must admit there is, su there is a subtle subtlety to that position that cannot be captured on tape, and that is not that spectacular when you realize the framework. And obviously this video does not provide the political historical framework where you can do that. Having said that, it is clear that this logic is a form of corruption. All the candidates except one are corrupted through history. The historical struggles of their political positions within the corrupt system of world politics has to corrupt them one way or another. There's nothing, really, there's nothing particularly special about this statement, but for me, one term stands out, stands out, revealing itself as probably the term that most holds the key to unlocking many complexities in Egyptian art practice from the 60s through to our current moment. That term is sovereignty. In 1964, Anwar Abdel Malik, uh, an Egyptian theorist with Marxist leanings who actually lives here in Paris, uh, described the then recently coined term Nasserism, stating, Nasserism, the word itself, an Egyptian proto is the word itself an Egyptian prototype of national develop development was unknown until recently. 
it has come to mean that mixture of radical independence, the reconquest of national identity, and emphasis on social progress, which is usually described as nationalism, but which it may be more accurate to characterize as the nationalitarian stage of development, to indicate the period during which the peoples of Asia, Africa, and Latin America are freeing themselves from imperialism and neo-imperialism, recovering and building up their own national identities and the world context of the Cold War. Now, this appears to be the standard definition of Nasserism. I'm not sure uh, I need to elaborate much more on this so-called radical independence. The elements of chance or of world politic dynamics that, uh, world political dynamics that contributed to its rhetoric and why it was seen to be important for the regime of the free officers, which was the coup d'etat that Nasser was part of, that is referenced as the first revolution in Egypt. But what concerns me here is the question of sovereignty and its use by the regime <clears throat> as the main currency in the construction of a superstructure of public being and of public imagination. In Jack Derrida's last seminars from 2001 to 2003, which were published later in two volumes under the title The Beast and the Sovereign, Derrida starts with a definition of the sovereign borrowed from the structural linguist Emile Benveniste. The sovereign is, the, in the broadest sense of the term, is he who has the right and the strength to be and to be recognized as himself the same, proper, proper, properly the same as himself. But the social political manufacturing of sovereignty is a matter of measures, of weights, and to a degree it is a matter of calculated distances. This is all embedded in a phrase that Derrida often uses in his seminars, the phrase, the sovereign, like a, do, uh, like a god, like a beast. Using this phrase, Derrida argues that throughout history, the social political space of sovereignty has been positioned in between two figures. God, a figure of absolute sovereignty above the law, and the beast or the animal, a figure below the law, without recourse to sovereign power or right. The relation between the beast and the sovereign thus rests on the operation of sovereign power as a relation of force. In these seminars, Derrida Ho also appears fascinated by the work of 17th century British thinker Thomas Hobbes, particularly his most prominent work of political theory, the, the, <clears throat> the Leviathan, in which Hobbes sets out his doctrine of the foundation of states and legitimate governments and thus originating social contract, contract theory. In one remarkably striking uh, passage, Derrida re-articulates a metaphorical explanation developed by Hobbes to explain how sovereignty functions within a society. The passage reads, this sovereignty is like an iron lung, an artificial respiration, an artificial soul, so the state is a sort of robot, an animal monster, is stronger, etc., than natural man, like a gigantic prothesis designed to amplify the power of the living, the living man that it protects, that it serves, but like a dead machine, or even a machine of death, a machine which is only the mask of the living. Like a machine of death can serve the living, but, th but this state and prosthetic machine must also extend, mime, imitate, and even reproduce down to the details the living creature that it proceed, that precedes it. <clears throat> Generally speaking, the 1952 revolution can be said to have three stages. This is the 1952 revolution. It's actually a coup d'etat, but it's known in Egyptian history as a revolution. Uh, can be said to have three stages. <clears throat> 1952 to 1954, a period of indecisiveness, which could have gone either way, democracy or military rule, 
ending with the latter after the house arrest of General Muhammad Naguib, who was the general in charge of the Free Officers Movement, who was put under house arrest by Nasser himself. In 19, uh, 1954 to 1961, the battle for sovereignty as a state on the international stage, the extensive restructuring of the bureau bureaucratic infrastructure, nationalization of key resources, and the rise of the new military elite as the new ruling class, escalation of, ba of, uh, of the battle against leftist political forces, the most ferocious, and against the Muslim Brotherhood. In 1961 to 1967, the strong socialist turn <clears throat> after the failure of the United Arab Republic, which was the project, Nasser's project to unify Egypt with Syria. Uh, the creation of a single party hegemonic system in the form of the Arab Socialist Union, the new national charter, like a new constitution made by Nasser, fermenting the intended socialist character of the state. Uh, Anwar Abdel Malik has a very famous quote about uh, this uh, whole period, uh, and he calls it actually socialism without socialists. You know, I think that's the perfect, uh, <coughs> the perfect explanation for you know the, the the state. You know, when socialism is without socialists, <laughs> socialists has become something really strange. Um, <coughs> okay, so here. Yeah, um, The new national charter fermenting the intended socialist character of the state, the slow but sure rise of the reactionary right wing within the ranks, and this is the non-religious right wing, you know, it's the right wing like normal right wing, within the ranks of the military ruling camp. The right wing that would actually later become Sadat and Mubarak. Mm. Uh, the, 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 um, the 1967 defeat, the Six-Day War. For artists and the intelligentsia, 1967, which is the, the year, <clears throat> let's say, the beginning of the demise of the Nasser regime. But it's also the cause of its continuation in the form of uh, a non-socialist state, uh, beginning with Sadat. Uh, for artists and the intelligentsia, 1976 does not seem to be the year when suddenly a realization of the non-inclusiveness and autocratic, autocratic nature of the regime strikes deep resentment or doubt, hindering artists' ability to position themselves within, within the inscribed conditions. In an article for the New Left Review, he wrote a few months after the Six-Day War. Anwar Abdel Malik describes the main rule that, the sh that shaped the regime's discourse regarding any political actor from outside the military ranks, the rule being, I think it's a beautiful rule, because it just describes our life, basically. Collaborate with them, absorb them, but at all costs, costs keep every decision-making power in your own hands, which is what, exactly what happened like a few days ago when the, when the, when the uh, army kind of like uh, absor you know dissolved parliament, did every you know it's the same. They've been doing the same since the, since the fifties. It's amazing. In other words, the quest for sovereignty had by the early sixties turned into the artificial synthesis of sovereignty by blocking out any elements as a threat to the original dream of a radically independent state. Not by naive censorship, but by the application of the above unspoken rule. The unfortunate thing for Nasser was that the threat to the sovereignty he was trying to build and sustain through complete military hegemony came from within and not from without his ranks. Naguib Mahfouz, the famous Egyptian uh, novelist, predicts this turn of affairs in his 1967 novel, Miramar. He portrays this in a short conversation between two of the novel's characters. One of them claims that the country only has two alternatives to Nasser's regime, the communists or the Muslim Brotherhood. The other character disagrees and states that there is a third alternative, America. 
What? America will rule us? How? Through the moderate rightist, through a moderate rightist group, the answer comes back. So, to a certain extent, the National Charter was the beginning of the end of Nasser's dreams of sovereignty. And the point at which the sovereignty of the state began to turn into Derrida, Derrida's Hobbes-inspired description of sovereignty as an iron, iron lung, gigantic prothesis designed to amplify the power of the living, so on, so on, so on. What consecutive generations of Egyptians experienced after 1967 was exactly this dead machine whose fuel continued to be sovereignty and the fear of non-independence despite there being little of it in the first place. I would argue that artists and writers were among the earliest to realize this predicament and in of, uh, of inflated sovereignty being the very raison d'etre of the regime's continuing existence. Abdel Hadi Ghazar, for example, is almost always referred to the the painting, the artist who painted this painting behind me, uh, is, uh, uh, for example, is almost always referred to as an artist promoting state ideology. Take this ex uh, excerpt describing his famous painting, Al Nithaq, or the Charter, that I just described here. Uh, this comes from a, from a book in the, in the 70s written by uh, an American art historian by the name of Carolyn Williams. In 1962, this is the, the, what she describes the charter as. In 1962, Abdul Hadi Ghazar won first prize in the competition titled The Revolution Ten Years After. With his al Mathak, the charter, it is a painting that brilliantly captures the new Egypt and, and its inclusive political aims. Egypt, her skin, the green color of a resurrected Osiris and crowned with the emblem of the Republic, stands in the center like a pharaonic tree goddess holding in her hand the charter of the revolution. The farmer and the worker kneel before her while behind her the priest and imam embrace. The worker holds a wrench and around him are machine parts, symbols of Egypt's industrialized future. The fallah, the name for a, father, a far, farmer in Egypt, looks down at the cotton blossom uh, and, and the mound of seeds in his hands. Next to him lies a paper headlined, Ownership of the Earth. But can we not read this painting using the Hobbesian Deridian notions of sovereignty, sovereignty as the main anchor of meaning? Cannot Lady Egypt, that green Lady Egypt here, be a body overtaken by the sovereignty of a machine, by the sovereignty machine? Does she not stand so inanimate that she could indeed be that iron lung, that gigantic prothesis designed to amplify the power of the living, a dead machine or even a machine of death, a machine which is only the mask of the living? So inanimate is the machine that she does not notice the citizens at her feet, but instead, fully immersed in her own sovereignty, looks into the void holding the charter and signaling an almost mechanical vow. Does not the worker look like he's pleading to the machine to communicate with him? Does not the farmer look down mournfully to his seedlings in his hand? Could not the priest and the imam in the background landscape actually be finding consolation, consolation and consolidation in each other instead of celebrating unity? Who holds the real ownership of the land headlined in the paper? But what has brought Lady Egypt to this condition? Again, Anwar Abdel Malik has an explanation in the late 1967. Uh, in late 1967, he states, the kernel of the crisis which affects the Egyptian national revolution and inhibits its development may now be formulated in two propositions. 
One, it is impossible to build a modern state in the absence of a political class, in the Gramscian sense of the term. Yet this is precisely what the military regime has been concerned to eliminate since 1952. Two, it is impossible to initiate a socialist revolution and to build a proper state, popular state in the absence of socialists without a mobilization of the popular masses, rural and urban, and the revolutionary intelligentsia, certainly not by relying on the political apparatus uh, uh, committed to a fight against the left, and by that fact open to all forms of penetration. To put it another way, Lady Egypt is above the law, like a god, while the farmer, the workman, the imam, and the priest are all below the law like a beast. After those faithful 18 days that started on January 25th, 2011, came to an end, Cairo and Alexandria were suddenly infested with billboards, small and large, featuring the Egyptian flag and the short phrase, Misr Fouq al or Egypt is above everyone, or above all. What or who is Egypt in this phrase? Mm. Of course, here Egypt does not mean the state of Egypt including its own citizens, but the state of Egypt without them. For the state has become so mechanical that its sovereignty is, so, is, see, is seen as something reproducible without citizens, uh, without its own citizens. Uh, citizens become beasts below the law. Thank you very much.